Hello, hello, and welcome back. I hope you're ready to be nosy because we're about to rifle through the dirty laundry of the top 10 powerful families in history you didn't want to mess with. Getting us started are more familiar names. Let's just get them out of the way for more of the unheard stuff, shall we? So to start, it's Genghis Khan. That's probably the most obvious start in this case. Good old Genghis was the ruler and emperor of the Mongol Empire, the largest empire in history. How do you do that? Well, even if they were outnumbered, which they usually were, the Mongols were masters of tactical and psychological warfare. They always had one time offer for any city or civilization they came across. If this people in the town surrendered, the Mongols would treat them well and allow them the fruits of a secure world. They had considerable personal liberty, religious freedoms, and overall more rights. Once the Mongols were empowered, their land were safe and well controlled. If however, the people resisted the Mongol advance, they and their cities would feel the full fury of the enraged invaders. The Mongols were violent, decapitating a path from the west shores of the Black Sea to the Pacific. Some experts calculate that fully 11% of the world's population died because of the Mongol expansion. He died in 1227 himself after defeating the Tanguts, and he left his successor and sons to handle everything. Th don't think they were any better, however, his grandson told the Pope that he'd only protect Christian pilgrimage to Jerusalem if the Pope brought every king of Christendom to Khan to swear fealty. And his son committed one of the worst Mongol atrocities recorded against the Oryats. So I could go on, but we got more freaks to talk about. Your takeaway is don't mess with a Mongol. At Hardy fans, you'll know this one, the craze. Dramatized in the 2015 movie Legends, these identical twins are unique in comparison to other criminal empire leaders. They ruled East End London with an iron fist during the swing in 60s. Their criminal empire depended on robbery and protection rackets to thrive. The craze and their associates would ensure compliance by readily resorting to arson, assault, and killings. The fear they inspired stopped even the most cowardly of snitches from saying a peep. They operated out of a nightclub and they were familiar figures on the street. But the streets are different during the day and surprising to many, ordinary people who were untouched by the craze business interests actually revered them. They acted as a sort of local authority, helping people with their problems, debts, hurtful spouses, or failing homes. They guaranteed safety on the street and delivered it. It wasn't even just the ordinary people that admired the Cray brothers, but celebrities and politicians too. The police arrested them in 1968 after Ronnie's mental decline caused by his refusal to take medication led to the operation to make some sloppy mistakes. AKA he literally killed two people at separate public events. Two occasions guys. Ronnie was sent to a high security psychiatric facility due to his instability but also his homosexuality. Unfortunately that's how the times were. He died in 1995 while his brother died in 2000, five weeks after authorities released him from prison on a compassion ground for his terminal cancer. This Spanish family has lurid tales but are, are they fact or are they fiction? The Borgias. Originally from Spain, the family became important in 15th century political and religious world. Caesar, the Borgias patriarch's father, was elected pope in 1492 of the titular church of Santa Maria Nova, making Caesar the archbishop and later the cardinal in 1492. Caesar, however, had no interest in religious vocation. He was better known at the papal court for his hunting parties and amorous liaisons and flashy clothes rather than meticulous religious observations. On the death of Pedro Luis in 1488, the title of Duke of Granda had been handed past him and gone to his younger brother Juan. When Juan was mysteriously murdered in 1497, the rumor gradually spread that Cesare was the culprit. Ambitious and hungry for yet more power, the family included two popes, one of which was Alexander, the father of the famous Lucrezia. Her family was perfectly happy to use her as a pawn in their power plays. She entered into several arranged marriages, each one helped the, Bar the Borgias extend their grip. She's also what inspired the belief that they really kept it in the family. After retiring to Napi after being a professional wife, Giovanni, dubbed the Roman infant, is seen at approximately age three for the first time. Two papal bulls recognize the child as an illegitimate son of first Caesar, her uncle, and then of Alexander, her dad, who probably was the true father. The mysterious origin of the child, as well as her presence at a celebrated night group romp in the Vatican, has been used to support the rumors. You can learn more about this disastrous family in a three season TV drama, literally named after them, the Borgias. Time to take life insurance policies out, we're meeting the Castro Angel Landing family. Ah, cult. You know there had to be at least one coming up. They love to call themselves families after all. Angel's Landing is the name of a 20 acre compound outside of Wichita, Kansas where Lou Castro and a small group of people lived an inexplicably extravagant life in the early 2000s. His followers were convinced he was an angel seer who saw the future and knew how people were going to die. Turns out the reason he knew was because he was going to be the one making it happen. Patricia Hughes showed up dead in 2003 and police turned their attention to the secluded luxury compound. There were high-end vehicles and appliances, well-kept lavish homes, 
pools and just a lot of wealth that wasn't accounted for or could be explained. Then Patricia's husband dies in 2006 on compound once again by a freak accident and Ron Goodwin dived into every bit of personal and financial information he could find on the people living at Angel's Landing. Turns out our buddy Castro took out expensive life insurance policies on certain cult members and had them cashed in by other members when someone in the makeshift family accidentally died. This pattern occurred around every two years and for about a decade unnoticed. Turns out his name wasn't even Lou Castro but Daniel Perez, a man from Texas with many police reports. Perez was charged with 28 felonies and in February 2015 he was convicted on all counts and sentenced to 80 years in prison. The cult was later profiled on an episode of Oxygen's Deadly Cult. Next up is Lucky Luciano. We love a fun and flirty nickname, one he earned for success at evading arrest and winning craps games. Lucky was the most powerful chief of American organized crime in the early 1930s and a major influence even from prison and after deportation to Italy. At 10 he was already involved in mugging, shoplifting, extortion. After a 6 month jail sentence when he was a teen, Lucky teamed up with Frank Costello and Mayor Lansky and other young gang and later New York's rising crime boss Joe Masseria, who he becomes second hand man to. In October of 1929 he becomes the rare survivor of a one way ride when he's abducted by four men in a car, beaten, stabbed, had his throat slit from ear to ear and was left for dead. But he survived and never named his abductors. Metal. Lucky had carefully nurtured his contacts with the young powers and had become the boss of all bosses without ever accepting or claiming the title. By 1934, he and the leaders of other crime families had developed the National Crime Syndicate. In 1936, Lucky was indicted, tried, and convicted for his brothels and call girl empire and was sentenced to Clinton prison for a 30 to 50 year term. From his cell, he continued to rule and issue orders, and in 1942, the luxury liner Normandy was destroyed in the New York Harbor and Navy intelligence sought Luciano's help in tightening waterfront security. Lucky gave the orders and sabotage on the docks ended and in 1946 his sentence was commuted and he was deported to Italy where he settled in Rome. He then bounced from Cuba to Naples and continued his crime empire until he died of a heart attack in an airport in Naples, Florida in 1962. A family gang of four so ferocious they have a catchy nickname to prove it, the Benders. The Benders settled in isolated Labette County, Kansas in the early 1870s following the new spiritualism movement. This is because Kate in her early 20s was renowned for performing seances that showed off her psychic abilities at the store inn that the family ran. But this wasn't as picturesque as it seems. Historians are very confident that the Benders, living as a husband, wife, young adult son, young adult daughter dynamic, actually weren't even related and none of them were even named Bender. And well it'd be no biggie if it wasn't for the fact so many people who happened to pass through Labette County never made it to their final destinations, including a well known local doctor William York. After a community meeting about York, attended by both of the male benders, it resulted in a search party formation and it was soon noted that the bender homestead appeared recently abandoned and full of evidence. Near the table where the guests were served was a trap door and the foul smelling hole beneath the door was just full of blood and gross stuff. The ground in an or orchard nearby the house has been carefully plowed but one small section was noticeably indented. The ground was dug up and revealed the decomposed body of Mr. York. Eight more bodies are found, skulls crushed, throats cut. Guests at the inn were urged to sit at the place of honor, which was a curtain dividing the house's rooms. While dining, the guest of honor would be hit in the head with a hammer from behind the curtain, his throat cut, and then his body dropped in the trap door to the cellar Sweeney Todd style. Their motive? Robbery or the thrill of it? Nobody actually knows, because despite a reward and several substantial claims of their capture at the hands of various posses, the benders appear to have gotten away with it, and their grim story continues to intrigue. One of the few mafiastos to be executed is Louis Lepke Butchialter. Nicknamed Lepkele, Little Louis in Yiddish, then shortened to Lepke, this crime boss was a quiet man for years managed to avoid public spotlight. In conversations with criminal associates, Lepke preferred listening over talking. He was an overall nice man, appreciated by the community for how he aided his neighbors. He generously compensated his crew members and took them to hockey games, boxing matches, and even winter cruises. He married a widower named Betty and adopted Betty's child from the previous marriage. In the early 1930s, Lepke created an effect process of performing contract killings for the Cosa Nostra mobsters. It had no name but the press 10 years later called it Murder Inc. The Cosa Nostra mobsters wanted to insulate themselves from any connection to these killings. So Lepke's partner would relay the contract request from the Costra to Lepke who would assign it to a street member who had no connections with any major crime family. If they were caught they could not implicate the Costra members in the crime. They were soon completing jobs all over the country for their mob 
mobster bosses, grossing over $1 million in profit per year. Ultimately, Lefke is cornered and forced to surrender after three years of hiding when the killing of Joseph Rosen, an informant, goes awry. He's tried for the killing of Rosen alongside three other murders, and Lefke is found guilty and sentenced to death. He exhausts his four appeals, but is executed by electric chair in 1944. You never know your neighbors, especially if they were Inessa, Roman, and their daughters. Inessa, a kindergarten teacher, and Roman, a successful dentist. Together, Inessa's daughters from her first marriage, 25-year-old Victoria, and just shy of legal daughter Anastasia, are responsible for the violent deaths of at least 30 people across southern Russia. Inessa and her family were highly organized, using information from Roman's sister and brother-in-law who had police connections to organize their crimes around police activity. This is because Inessa liked to go after police officers as one had left her for another woman in the past. And her current husband didn't feel like she was living in the past either? Okay, alright. Their victims weren't exclusively police officers, however, the family MO was breaking and entering the houses of sleeping families while they road tripped under the guise of going on monthly camping trips. One victim was a police officer named Ivan, who was killed when he attempted to stop members of the gang from fleeing the scene of the crime. Roman was eventually killed in a bloody standoff with police, and Inessa was arrested. A search of the family home uncovered a slew of weaponry, a complete arsenal. Inessa, Anastasia, and Victoria all confessed to their crimes, the six year reign ending. Vladimir Markin, the chief of Russia's equivalent to the FBI, said, I'm sure that when they were together, one could hardly imagine that they could even plan a crime. It sounds so much more innocent than it is. The Bean Clan. Picturesque Scotland, a land of mystery and rolling dewy fields, glens, and hills that 100% have eyes. That's right, we're talking about the freaks who inspired the nauseating horror movie that we're never gonna forget anytime soon. Back in the 16th century, Alexander Bean and his partner, Black Agnes Douglas, set up home in a hidden sea cave and started popping out babies. Why? I don't know. Why a cave? Again, I don't know. Maybe they just wanted the saltiest and driest sinuses and intercourse ever. Well, the weirdos never left that cave, and they never let any of the kids leave it either. By keeping it in the family, the clan eventually grew to about 45 members, all starting from just the two. Jobs were hard to come by when you're not part of society and potentially terrifying looking from inbreeding, so why not just murk and eat travelers whenever you're feeling peckish or want a new shirt? That's exactly what they did, operating only at night and retiring to their cave by day where they could enjoy a roasted meal of unfortunate victims and rest like weird hick vampires. Locals had no idea what was going on because they weren't being picked away at like croutons from the veggie tray and the bean clan survived doing this for 25 years, munching down on what's estimated to be about a thousand people. Naturally, it eventually gets found out by the locals and they decide to do an old fashioned mob style on this one. They descend on the cave and cut the off the men, followed by their hands and feet, leaving them to bleed to death. Everyone else was burnt alive. I'm sure if they could have, these weirdos would have attended their own massacre just to snack on their own cooking remains. And now the most dysfunctional family in history, the Ptolemies. The last dynasty of Greek Egypt. Their first three monarchs of the dynasty were capable, vigorous sorts that did things like build the great library at Alexandria on their weekends off. But from the fourth century forward, it was nightmarish. It's like they were on a game show where you tried to kill as many of your close relatives as you were able, preferably in as painful and public of a way as possible. This is complicated for two reasons. One, they kept the names in the family, men were always named Ptolemy, and women, nine times out of ten, were called Cleopatra. Two, they kept their seed in the family too, following the Egyptian tradition, brother and sister wed and had children. This means it's not easy to explain who is killing whom. What follows offered is a kind of prose poem compiled of examples dedicated to the most bestial family in history. Alright, so, Platonomy 5 was the nicest of the later Platonomies and thoughtfully had his mother's killers ripped apart by a mob. Platonomy 6 fought his own brother for the throne and then married his sister Cleopatra 2. Platonomy 4 kills his mom who had killed her husband for having a love affair with her mother. Platonomy 8 was a great enemy of Platonomy 6 and the probable killer of Platonomy 7. He also married Cleopatra 2 and then began an affair with Cleopatra's daughter Cleopatra 3. So Platonomy 8 had Platonomy 6 dismembered and the pieces sent to the mother Cleopatra 2. I could keep going like for hours. They burnt, burnt, cooked, eviscerated, literally anything you can think of, they did to one another. All of this comes down to the bottom of the family tree, Cleopatra 7, the daughter of Platonomy 12, the famous Caesar loving, Mark Anthony loving Cleopatra who blew Egypt out of the water. I need a water break after that. Alright, we've hit the end of the list. Thank you so much once again for tuning in. Be sure to like and subscribe to see more Bumblebee content and comment down below if you think your family could make this list.